Hello and welcome to our next lecture in Physiological Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about the biological clock. This will be the first of two lectures uh, related to our circadian rhythms. The next lecture will be primarily devoted to our sleep cycle. We'll start off by talking about the biological clock. So today we're going to talk about uh, endogenous circadian rhythms, cortisol and the relationship with circadian rhythms, what happens when we have disruptions in our circadian pattern patterns, doing things like traveling, changes in um, time at the spring and fall, that sort of thing. Uh, talk about individual differences and then finish up with some mechanisms of the biological clock. As you can see uh, in the next lecture, we'll get into sleep, sleep stages, and functions of sleep. But for now, let's talk about endogenous circadian rhythms. All animals produce an endogenous circadian rhythm. And endogenous simply means that it is controlled internally. So we have internal mechanisms that operate on an uh, approximate 24-hour cycle. These include our sleep cycle, how often we eat and drink, changes in body temperature, secretion of hormones, urination, and sensitivity to drugs all alter as part of this 24-hour cycle. Some animals generate endogenous circannual rhythms, and these are annual rhythms based on their internal biology, so these internal mechanisms that operate on an annual or yearly cycle. So these include things like bird migratory patterns, uh, food storage behaviors, uh, hibernation for the winter, storing fat for the winter. These are all different types of circannual rhythms that are based on uh, internal mechanisms as well as external environmental cues such as position of the sun, length of the day, etc. So to give you an idea about how our um, temperature changes over the 24-hour cycle, uh, primarily it rises um, as we move through the day and then starts to fall as we get closer to the time that we uh, fall asleep. So you can see it's lowest, sort of two hours into um, our sleep cycle, and then rises again as we start to wake, and then gets at its highest during the day. So the purpose of the circadian rhythm is to keep our internal workings in phase with the outside world. The human circadian clock generates a rhythm slightly longer than 24 hours when it has no external cues to set it. Um, so there's been some classic studies where they lock people into um, places with absolutely no external environmental cues. Um, so I think in one study they, put, they were in a cave or somewhere. Um, they had no clocks, no way to see the sun, no way to know what, what was happening, and they fell into a little bit longer than 24-hour um, period, closer to 25 hours. So sometimes resetting our circadian rhythm is uh, sometimes necessary to get us back on sort of schedule. Uh, the Germans have this uh, phrase called a Zeitgeber, which is time giver, which refers to the stimulus that resets the circadian rhythm. So things like sunlight, tides, exercise, meals, arousal of any kind, Oh, meals again, <laughs> temperature of the environment, etc. So these are external cues that provide us um, with cues to get us back on track. This is one of the reasons why it's oftentimes very difficult for shift workers uh, to change shifts uh, or to get out of their uh, usual rhythm, and oftentimes why shift work is, all, uh, is so stressful. So things like depression, irritability, and impaired job performance are effects of using something other than sunlight as a zeitgeber. One of the things that uh, changes throughout our 24-hour cycle are our cortisol levels. And as we've learned in a number of uh, instances, cortisol is a very important part of understanding our um, cognitive performance and internal environment. So cortisol levels rise and fall as part of, as part of our uh, twice-daily circadian rhythm cycle. So cortisol levels also tend to spike right after meals. So you can kind of see here, um, in what's called the nadir phase, which is generally when we're asleep. Uh, very low levels of cortisol, they start to rise as we wake, really peak just after we wake, and then start to fall again throughout the day. And so we go through this kind of general phase. And we have some individual peaks along here when we eat breakfast and lunch and dinner. Cushing's disease and chronic fatigue uh, are both associated with disruptions in both sleep and cortisol. Uh, because this cortisol um, 
cycle gets so severely disrupted, particularly in Cushing's disease. Uh, Cushing's disease is caused by a uh, tumor, usually in the hypothalamus area, uh, that causes uh, massive uh, releases of cortisol. And so cortisol levels are way off the chart. So people are even higher than where uh, they're, they would normally be during their awake time. And so as a result, uh, their 24-hour sleep cycle is quite disrupted. Other disruptions in circadian patterns can occur due to jet lag, which of course refers to the disruption of the circadian rhythm due to crossing of time zones. This stems from a mismatch of the internal circadian clock and of course the external time. Uh, it can include things like sleepiness during the day, sleeplessness at night, and impaired concentration. And obviously the further you travel, the worse this gets. If you travel west, you have a phase delay in your circadian rhythm. This is what happens uh, during the fall time change when we fall backwards. So essentially you kind of essentially are gaining time and so it delays your circadian rhythm uh, in relation to the external environment. Traveling east phase advances our circadian rhythm. This is what happens in spring when we spring forward. Uh, you essentially lose hours and uh, no surprise it's actually much more difficult uh, to fly east because you're losing hours and so you tend to tends to be a little bit more disruptive than flying west. Uh, people seem to uh, be able to uh, get back uh, to uh, through their jet lag when they fly west uh, easier than when they fly east. Other ways that shift work can get, or sorry, that circadian patterns can get disrupted is through shift work. Uh, sleep duration depends on when, of course, one goes to sleep. Working at night does not reliably change your circadian rhythm. You still want to be asleep. People adjust best to night work if they sleep in a very dark room during the day and work under very bright lights at night. So this is particularly difficult for um, police officers, for example, who obviously can't work all night in bright lights. Um, we also know that shift work is associated with decreased physical and mental health, increased rates of depression, uh, very high levels of blood pressure caused by shift work, uh, and those can be lasting because of this sort of shift in circadian rhythm patterns. There are a lot of different uh, individual differences in uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, we now know there are morning and evening type people, so cycles can differ between people and lead to different patterns of wakefulness and alertness. Uh, there's actually a thing called the morningness and eveningness questionnaire you can look up and take to figure out if you're more morning type or more evening type. Uh, there are clear age differences in circadian rhythm. Uh, very young children are morning people. Adolescents tend to more often be night people. In particular, adolescents and teenagers need a lot of sleep. And so one of the things that uh, we're starting to see is a shift in school starting time because school starting time seem to have crept earlier and earlier. Uh, and we know that kids just don't do that well in the morning. Uh, there's also some question about whether or not colleges should have 8 a.m. classes uh, because it's simply too early for your age range to function that well. Unfortunately, uh, people who have to teach classes oftentimes are older and those older adults tend to be more morning people. There is some genetics involved in this uh, apparently, but uh, older adults tend to function best first thing in the morning and so we have a little bit of a problem when it comes to things like teaching classes as to who's older or younger and when they're performing best. There are also some gender differences. Um, if you look, for example, um, you can see sort of when more males are more likely to um, sleep in than females, uh, particularly uh, in their 20s, uh, than are um, their female counterparts of the same age. This starts to sort of coalesce around uh, age 45 or 50. So how does the biological clock work? Well, the first uh, place we'll look at is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, this is the main control center of the circadian rhythms of sleep and temperature. This is located just above the optic chiasm and is part of the hypothalamus. This is, of course, part of the reason why Cushing sy syndrome patients have such disruption because that's where their tumor is. Uh, damage to the suprachiasmatic chiasmatic nucleus uh, results in less consistent body rhythms that are no longer synchronized to environmental patterns of light and dark. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is getting information from the visual system to try to get us in synchronization. So if we look here, we have the optic chiasm, which is of course the where the optic nerve crosses over. Um, and right above that is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which it's called that because it's above the optic chiasm. 
And so this is apparently giving visual information to the hypothalamus to get us in sync uh, with our external environment. So this generates our circadian rhythms in a genetically controlled and unlearned manner. Uh, if you extract a single cell from these supercosmotic nucleus and raise it in tissue culture, it continues to produce action potentials in a rhythmic pattern. And so this is part of establishing our 24-hour sleep-wake cycle is occurring through information from the supercosmotic nucleus. The, retino the retinohypothalamic path, so light resets the um, supercosmotic nucleus via a small branch of the optic nerve known as the retinohypothalamic path. This travels directly from the retina to the supercosmotic nucleus. The retinohypothalamic path comes from a special population of ganglion cells that have their own photopigment called melanopsin. The cells respond directly to light and do not require any input from the rods or cones. And so what they're doing, their sole purpose is to provide information to the supercosmotic nucleus to uh, provide information about whether or not uh, the, it is day or night. So these cells respond directly to light and do not require any input from the rods or cones. Now there is some evidence that these uh, cells uh, respond more to shorter wavelengths of light, uh, which is why uh, a lot of uh, phones, iPads, and other devices will now uh, limit the amount of um, short wavelength light or blue light uh, if it's nighttime in order to keep you from staying awake. The important thing to understand is if you are, if light is triggering um, this retinohypothalamic pathway, it's telling your body to stay awake. And so it's one of the pr biggest problems with sleep disruption are things like devices uh, and etc. There's interestingly um, a science project I read about recently uh, where some high school students did some investigations about Wi-Fi signals and they believe that Wi-Fi signals actually can disrupt sleep patterns as well. Um, so it may be worth moving that phone, iPad, etc. out of the bedroom. So the biochemistry of the circadian rhythm, there are two types of genes that are responsible for generating the circadian rhythm. Um, the period genes produce proteins called PER and timeless produce proteins called TIM. Pair and TIM proteins increase the activities of certain kinds of neurons in the suprachiasmotic nucleus that regulate sleep and waking. Mutations in the P per gene result in odd circadian rhythms or decreased alertness if deprived of good night's sleep. So if you look at the per and TIM messenger RNA concentrations and the protein concentrations, they have a 24-hour um, uh, sleep and wake part to them as well. So these proteins seem to be an important part of this um, process as well. Melatonin, uh, the supercosmic nucleus regulates waking and sleeping by controlling activity levels in other areas of the brain. It regulates the pineal gland, which is an endocrine gland based, located posterior to the thalamus. The pineal gland secre secretes melatonin, which is a hormone that increases sleepiness. Melatonin secretion usually begins two to three hours before bedtime. Now this is why if uh, people take the supplement melatonin, you're told to take it a couple hours before bedtime. It's essentially trying to uh, replace the melatonin secreted by the pineal gland. Um, there is emerging evidence that it doesn't quite work that way, and in fact some of melatonin supplements have been found to be quite dangerous. So that's something to be cautious with if you're taking it. So melatonin from the pineal gland feeds back to reset the biological clock through its effect on receptors in the supercosmotic nucleus. If you take it in the afternoon, it can phase advance the internal clock and can be used as a sleep aid, but as I said, there's emerging evidence that perhaps that might not be uh, the best idea. So that's a quick summary of melatonin and its effects on um, sleepiness. So in our next lecture, we'll pick up on uh, talking about sleep and its stages and um, the biological basis of things like dreams.